So this session is about kind of key opportunities, barriers, and challenges, some of the practical issues in terms of acceptance, implementation, and the like. So we're going to have each of the speakers speak for about three to five minutes. We'll run through all the speakers before and then open it up to a broad discussion. So good morning, everybody. Uh, good morning also to the people that are following us uh, uh, through, through the internet. Uh, let me start by saying that it's a pleasure to be here as OECD and personally as well. Uh, the objective uh, of uh, my short talk uh, this morning, five minutes or so, and I, don't pre I didn't prepare slides, or, uh, but I'll try to go through my, my stream of thought, is really to talk about uh, what are the potential opportunities, uh, challenges, and uh, to some extent technical issues uh, that uh, we uh, should try to address uh, if we want cost-benefit analysis to be a uh, um, tool uh, more used uh, and more uh, applicable to decision-making context. So let, let me start by the opportunity. I, I see potentially uh, uh, cost-benefit analysis as a uh, as very interesting, important tool uh, to broaden decision-making across different sectors, uh, bringing together uh, different types of measure into a common single value uh, with all the limits uh, that uh, uh, this uh, entails, of course, uh, is potentially something that helps prioritizing intervention across different sectors. There are, however, uh, a number of challenges uh, to uh, put in place uh, to implement this type of, uh, of mechanism. The first one, which is very well described, I think, uh, by the scoping paper, is uh, on uh, uh, placing the monetary value itself. That's something that, uh, particularly in the healthcare sector, is not uh, seen as uh, um, a, a way to move forward. If I, if I go back to my early days at the university, when I started getting uh, interested, uh, interested in, uh, in this world, you know, I could uh, summarize uh, the main messages that I got uh, with the following sentence. Cost effective analysis is uh, acceptable, cost benefit analysis is bad. Uh, and, uh, and that's essentially what, uh, you know, to some extent, uh, many of the policy makers uh, in the healthcare sector uh, keep uh, uh, following as, as a general rules. This morning, we started talking about how to increase the use of cost-benefit analysis. We focused, and I think the scoping paper focuses perhaps a little bit too much uh, on uh, increasing uh, use uh, by who carries out the analysis, people like us uh, in, in this uh, uh, room or that are following us on the internet. I think that if we want to increase the use of cost-benefit analysis, we should work at the same time on the final users. So it's not just a matter of producing more people that are able, that can carry out this type of exercise, but also inducing the demand for this type of study by policymakers. And when I talk about policymakers, I mean policymakers of various levels. Uh, from the various funders and organizations, but also uh, in, in the country, from the Minister of Health and the other ministries to the local uh, policymakers. And this entails uh, also a better preparation for understanding uh, the type of, uh, of analysis, trying to tackle some of the uh, misconceptions uh, that uh, um, <clears throat> are involved with cost-benefit analysis and more broadly with cost-effective analysis, but also uh, from our side to produce analysis uh, that fit better the needs uh, of the persons uh, that uh, will eventually use this analysis. So uh, I identified a few things that I think are uh, uh, priorities for us to try to address uh, in producing uh, uh, this type of analysis. The first one is really to define better and to understand what is the counterfactual scenario or the comparator for our analysis. Uh, in the vast majority of times, uh, we use a sort of no policy scenarios, while when we try to adapt uh, to, to implement new policies uh, in, in the real world, uh, you know, there are already a number of different things that are happening, policies that in some cases may have a positive multiplicative effect with uh, the intervention we want to test, in some other cases that uh, uh, go against our, our intervention. And uh, this happens in a number of different, uh, different sectors. We should take, I think, better into account the current context in the country to produce analysis that fits better with the needs of the country. The second issue, uh, which again was, uh, was mentioned this morning, is uh, uh, the time horizon uh, which is closely linked to uh, the discounting we are using. 
When it comes to intervention and some of the priorities that uh, uh, our colleagues from the Gates Foundation mentioned this morning, for example, intervention in the area of nutrition, agriculture, education, these are interventions that produce uh, their effect uh, and provide uh, their, uh, their benefits uh, in, uh, in the, I, I finished the sentence, the longer term. While uh, we have to apply the cost right now, this is something that I think uh, we are not matching uh, uh, perfectly, particularly when it comes to intervention targeted children. Now, the last point uh, that I want to make is really on uh, uh, the presentation of the results. Most of our work uh, is addressed uh, to people like us. So the, the primary objective is to produce uh, uh, papers that goes perhaps on good journals, while uh, this type of information not necessarily uh, the most useful for policymakers that are not necessarily capable of coping with uh, too technical papers. So clearly, sound evidence is the basis for any analysis we do, but we should try to provide uh, the information in a format uh, that can be better managed and uh, uh, used by the policymakers. And I'll stop here. Thanks. So, uh, thank you. So the next speaker is um, Calypso Chalkadu from Imperial College. Thank you. Thanks very much. So, um, okay, I guess uh, uh, Lisa had prepared a fantastic document and you've advised us to talk specifically on, uh, on the challenges bit uh, and the opportunities. So, um, the first bit is about norms, and I guess my concerns are around the second uh, type of norms. The first is whether people are uh, feel that uh, attributing monetary values to, to health uh, is unethical. I don't have a problem with that. But the second bit of norms, and perhaps I'm not quite sure whether it is that normative, is how one values, and, and it, it speaks to what also Michelle said just now. And I think these are concerns that apply equally to some extent to BCA and cost effectiveness analysis. So how do we uh, measure value and, and estimate opportunity costs in a way that's meaningful and, uh, and actually leads to recommendations that can be implementable, that means fundable. So um, I think my concern there is very much about that not losing that pragmatism and uh, sort of a constant fear that might end up doing more harm than good. And I just wanted to read to you very quickly the section of the NICE guidance, which is specific to health um, most of the time, though now it does a lot more social care as well, when it comes to cost-benefit analysis. So the guidance uh, to the committees, the decision makers, is this. It says that when you consider cost-benefit analysis, be aware that an aggregate of individual willingness to pay is likely to be more than public sector willingness to pay, sometimes by quite margin. It's been mentioned already. If a conversion factor has been used to estimate public sector willingness to pay from an aggregate or individual, please take this into account. In the absence of that, please consider the discrepancy in the two in making uh, recommendations. So affordability, you know, can, we, can we act, can we pay on the back of such decisions uh, or other recommendations? And the second one is about equity or need. So uh, uh, please determine whether any adjustments should be made to convert ability to pay estimates into those that prioritize on the basis of need and the ability of an intervention to meet that need. I think that's quite insightful because obviously it's a sort of relatively advanced system in applying economics to making decisions, but that's the sort of concern that uh, policymakers with budgets, with responsibility for budgets, directly or indirectly have. So that's my first um, question. On capacity, I think absolutely important to build capacity, but perhaps more important even, again, uh, I think I sort of duplicated the earlier um, uh, 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 colleague, uh, if, again, both for BCA and cost effectiveness analysis, capacity for asking for this type of analysis, not for commissioning it, for quality assuring it, for interpreting it, for acting on it, the institutional infrastructure that allows governments, payers, insurance funds to interact with universities, academic centers in their countries. And that's what we see when we work in, in countries, that, that weakness in, in, in making that link. Uh, on data capacity, I mentioned earlier, I think very important uh, to, to come up with empirical estimates uh, of, of, of these valuations and perhaps also try and estimate the harm which we could be doing if we were to adopt uh, VSL type GDP adjusted estimates. Tommy did the back of the envelope calculation on South Africa uh, using the 9.2 million in the US and it turns out that uh, it would look a perfectly good investment for the South African government to spend one third of its total public expenditure on health on three maternal child health interventions. Now, 
if we're going to be serious, we shouldn't be coming up with these things. And therefore, if we were coming up with these things, then we might be distorting. Uh, and if people are listening, uh, we might be doing more harm than good. Now, there's a reason for talking like that in an aspirational fashion, making the case. And I think that's the work that uh, Dean is doing is, is very important in that sense, in, to, to drive people to think about what they're losing if they're not increasing spending on certain areas. But I think when it comes to the specifics of allocation, that's uh, rather dangerous. So um, anyway, I'll, I'll stop there. Am I OK? Thanks very much for listening. Great. So next we have Anil Dialakar from UC Riverside. Jim. Uh, I would say uh, Lisa tried to get the six of us to coordinate what we were going to say, but I don't think she was too <laughs> successful. Uh, and, and she was not successful because we were not very cooperative. And we, did, we do not, as a normal rule, follow deductions. Uh, so you asked us all to send you something. <laughs> uh, so some of it, I think you may, you may hear things repeated. Uh, but I thought long and hard about how, what I would say that might not be said by the others. And uh, I came up with two or three. Uh, things that I thought uh, are challenges as we move forward on the BCA. Uh, the first one is actually relating to the cost side of BCA because much of the attention has focused on the benefit side of the uh, ratio, benefit cost ratio. Uh, and in a sense, that's not fair because uh, what I'm about to say is really applies to both cost effectiveness analysis as well as BCA. Uh, I'm a development economist, and uh, traditional BCA reminds me of the Soviet centralized planning models that were in vogue in the 1950s and 60s. In those models, output was assumed to be produced according to a Leontief or fixed proportions type technology, uh, which meant that if you wanted to produce a ton of steel, you had to use iron ore and labor and capital in fixed proportions. Uh, and there was only one way to do it, and that was the way that you incorporated into those linear programming uh, um, planning models that, that were in vogue in not just the Soviet Union, but in China and India and other countries that followed that approach. Uh, so of course, to an economist, that's sort of a very odd way of producing output because uh, we usually think of smoothly differentiable production functions uh, that allow for input substitution possibilities at the margin. Uh, well, to some extent, there is an analogy here to BCA, because we typically assume that there is one way, uh, a package, a single sort of package of curing a disease or achieving a health outcome using health workers, hospital beds, and drugs. Uh, just to name a few inputs. And usually we think of these inputs as being used in fixed proportions to, uh, to address tuberculosis or, uh, or any other disease. And, uh, and, and of course, in the real world, that's not the case. There are uh, probably quite a few substitution possibilities at the margin uh, for substituting one input, say labor, for another input, say hospital beds. And these substitution choices, in turn, uh, depend, that's the more important thing, depend on the prices of these inputs. So it's sort of, you're almost talking about uh, price-induced uh, substitution. So that led me to think uh, what sort of happened in the last 10, 20 years. Uh, we have actually seen a lot of what people are calling as frugal innovation that has uh, been driven largely by uh, emerging economies and in emerging economies. Uh, and, uh, and, and this frugal innovation, uh, as a, a, whole, a magazine of The Economist, uh, an economist issue was devoted to frugal innovation uh, 
a year or two back. And uh, it was quite interesting because, of course, there's frugal innovation, and, and it, it's not just in the health sector, but it pervades everything. Uh, you're talking about cell phone technology and, and medical technologies. Uh, you see this, and this has been spurred by the low purchasing power of consumers in these low-income countries, as well as the high cost of capital. And so there has been sort of substitution uh, of uh, labor for capital. Uh, and, and so, in a sense, what I'm thinking about is op these are opportunistic solutions that have come up. These are the clever use of modern cheap and available for everyone technologies to tackle old problems. Uh, for instance, you heard of uh, scientists in India who have developed a credit card size mobile EKG machine uh, for less than $100. Uh, Chinese scientists are apparently just about to develop a CT scanner that for a fraction of the cost of a standard Siemens CT scanner. Uh, and there are countless examples of uh, screening uh, uh, tests and other things that uh, 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 have sort of been developed in developing countries. So I recognize it's not easy to allow for input price dependent substitution possibilities in the production of health uh, in traditional BCA, uh, but it is worth thinking about this issue as I wonder if static BCA ratios sometimes trap us into what is called a legacy mindset uh, where we think the cost of fighting a disease is more or less fixed and cannot be dramatically reduced with endogenous sort of technological change. I wonder if we can think more about dynamic BCAs where we allow for sort of induced innovation, uh, which uh, drives down the cost of an intervention and therefore drives up the BCA uh, in some quantum uh, way. Uh, the other two quick issues, and I know I'm running out of time and it'll just take a minute, uh, and, and again, these, I don't need to belabor this because uh, uh, both Jim and Tommy referred to these. I think uh, the whole issue of uh, discount rates is very important. And, and especially now, I think the, the problem, we know how sensitive BCAs are to the, the discount rate that you use. And I worry that because of uh, global capital markets, uh, interest rates across the world are more or less converging. Uh, but we know from, uh, from economic theory as well as uh, empirical analysis that discount rates in developing countries uh, are much lower. Uh, uh, I mean, much higher. Uh, people discount the future much more uh, because there is an urgent need for current consumption. Uh, so how does this really affect our BCAs? Uh, especially, I think, who was it that I think maybe Lisa mentioned intergenerational, or Jim mentioned, intergenerational benefits. Some interventions have intergenerational benefits. How do we square that with, with high discount ratios? Uh, and, and then the last issue I wanted to flag was the one about uh, heterogeneity. Uh, in medicine, we are all talking about precision medicine. How do you, you know, different uh, medical interventions affect each individual differently than the other. It's based on your gene genomic type rather than on on socioeconomic groups of individuals. In economics, uh, much of modern economic theory, uh, applied economics is all about heterogeneity of impact. Uh, and yet a lot of the BCA is sort of done at a very aggregate level. And so uh, that's something I think is worth thinking about. How do you disaggregate and uh, disaggregate BCA and bring in uh, heterogeneity, individual heterogeneity, or at least subgroup heterogeneity uh, into BC analysis? So, that's all. Thank you. Thank you. So next, um, David Evans from the World Bank. Thanks very much. I almost fell backwards off the stage, so uh, everyone has to look out as you come here. Um, I, I come to this. Uh, Initially starting my career doing benefit cost analysis in developing countries in the agricultural sector largely. And I moved into health where I gravitated towards cost effectiveness analysis, working with qualities first and then preferring dallies. And then moved on to health systems financing more broadly, again in low and middle income countries where priority setting is part of the problem, not the only problem. So my comments reflect that personal experience. They're not necessarily the views of the bank. 
Um, we were asked to start with opportunities, and it's very clear, as people said this morning, that cost-effectiveness analysis doesn't value some of the benefits that are associated with improving health, um, uh, some of the economic benefits. Uh, there's been a demand, certainly, that I've seen for a broader form of analysis that can do that. The question is, as people have asked this morning, where does that demand come from? I've personally seen it more, as Dean said, from the social determinants type community working side by side with the health community. So that the water and sanitation, Dean mentioned, the environmental pollution people who feel that their interventions are undervalued compared to health interventions because they're not primarily concerned with improving health, they have other benefits as well. So there has been a demand from that community. There is the demand, almost the inverse of that, from sectors such as traffic environment, feeling that interventions in their sectors that have health impacts undervalue, are undervalued compared to other interventions because the health impacts can't be captured as well. And so, as you know, in the US, there's, there's a lot of people doing this type of benefit cost analysis in traffic accidents, environment, et cetera. So those two demands are there. For different reasons, but other sides of the same coin. I actually haven't seen a demand for this from the health sector. Um, and, uh, and it's, again, personal experience. Um, and others, uh, others might see it. Um, except with that ministries of health are willing to do anything and jump through any hoop if they think the Ministry of Finance is going to give them more money. So let me return to that, whether this intersectoral sort of type analysis is going to achieve the goal. So wh what, are the, what are the issues, the opportunities, and the constraints in a way? In the health sector, I think the constraints are enormous to doing what Dean was suggesting and doing intrasectoral analysis using benefit cost analysis. There's a number of reasons, some of which were mentioned, but one of this one of them is obviously from the people trained in health feeling that we are putting a money money value on improving lives. And I think that emotionally, intellectually, ethically, a lot of people have problems with that. Um, there are, as Dean again mentioned, the problem of assuming with the value of statistical life that saving the life of a 70-year-old is as good as saving the life of a child. And as someone who's pushing the boundaries of 70 and has a seven-year-old and a two-year-old kid, <laughs> the idea that, that for a given value of money you choose to save my life instead of my kids, I think is totally contrary to the way most people believe. And that's what a value of statistical life or the benefit cost analysis at the moment is doing. I think a lot of the economists working in health also have problems with this because mainly through the market failure type approach, because when you're dealing with low and middle income countries, the idea that you can take a value of statistical life based on people's free preferences in an open labor market of their choices for doing risky interventions, for example, or that extrapolating from the US to Kenya based on GDP per capita has some meaning when when labor markets are so different and people's time preferences are so different, mm. I think is is something that you've that's a big sell to try and ask people to do that. Um, and there are other issues to do to deal with it, willingness to pay, also the idea with information <coughs> failures that you can actually um, get people to to make useful evaluations of what they're willing to pay, particularly if you're close to death, the reduction. You know, if you're 99% certain to die in the next year, how much would you pay for a small risk? Uh, these are things that are well known with uh, risk reduction. It's well known, but they're, they're real problems with getting accepted. So let me just very quickly turn to the intersectoral action. Is it useful for intersectoral actions? I think it's more useful, but there's problems. I don't see any Ministry of Health that I've dealt with being impressed by an investment case that says my health intervention has a benefit cost ratio of 100 to 1. I don't see that being useful in getting Ministries of Health to allocate more money to health uh, because 
tomorrow it's, it's going to be the child health, the next day it's going to be the, uh, the malaria people, the next day it's going to be cardiovascular. And how much of his budget does he have to give to health? A back of the envelope calculation like Calypso did, if you just do the things in the basic essential package that cost around nine, $90 per capita now, in countries that are spending $20, $30 per capita of, of, uh, of government money on health, you've got to quadruple the budget. So they're spending the average, the median low and middle income countries spending just under 10% on health. Are you going to say you spend 40% on health tomorrow to do all of these things that benefit cost analysis says is, is essential? I don't think that they're, they're sort of, you know, it's another side of the South African case that gives you, it gives you results that don't seem to make sense. But the other part is the methods, and Dean alluded to it. If we use the methods of cost-benefit analysis that, for health, seem to make sense, let's, let's uh, assume away the problems with value of statistical life, etc. Are we capturing, are we overvaluing the health compared to education, for example? And Dean said that the way that you're doing cost-benefit cost analysis in education only takes some of the benefits of education. You know, okay, my seven-year-old son doesn't see an intrinsic value of education. There's, it's not necessarily better than football, but most people would see an intrinsic value of education similar to the intrinsic value of health that's not captured in that. And yet we're sort of trying to say, how do we use benefit-cost analysis to value the health benefits when we're not doing it properly in the other sectors as well? So maybe that, sorry, I went a little bit over time. But that's some sort of things that we can think about uh, over the next part of the day. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so Federico Guanes from the American Development Bank. <clears throat> Thanks. Um, I just want to make um, three uh, quick points, quick comments. Um, first point on a no normative um, aspects um, is that um, politics matters okay so I think we're talking a lot about policy here but this is going to have a very important implication in terms of the, 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 the political arena and out of the 26 member countries of the IDB in Latin America and the Caribbean 17 have guaranteed the constitutional right to health okay so um, this is very important, um, but it shows that there's a very strong um, resistance and reaction um, to the notion of priority setting uh, in many constituencies. So I think for us, the implication here is that we need to be very mindful of the language that we use in order in how to communicate these things. So talking about uh, willingness to pay, to willingness to accept and value of statistical life to many constituencies, say in, in my home country, in Brazil, um, of the of the health um, um, activist movement, so and that's going to generate a strong reaction and strong pushback. So, um, and in in my work, my daily work at the IDB, I face this issue ev all the time. Um, so I think I think we need to be mindful of, for this in the way we communicate the process and the rationale for priority setting. But. This, this is what I see a challenge, right? But then I think this is also an opportunity. And the, I have um, interesting lessons from Latin America and the Caribbean, the things that I've learned. Um, so coming back to my earlier point on priority setting in health. Um, so despite the constitutional right to health in these 17 countries, and I think this, my account, my account is actually underestimating the number of countries that ha I haven't looked in the constitution. I'm going to complete and look in the constitution of the, all the 26 countries to see exactly what they say. But at least 17, I can guarantee to have a constitutional right to health. Um, so, but of course, we know the exercise of these rights vary a lot, right? Which one in Brazil can say? Oh, yes, I can exercise my constitutional right to health all the time. So, and moreover, I think there are budgetary constraints that, of course, establish the need for establishing priorities, right? To, to push this for more and more. And there are many reasons, we all know. 
um, less favorable macroeconomic scenario, um, so aging of population, technology issues, increased demand from the citizens, um, and an active role of the judiciary. Imagine if the United States, you had a constitutional right to health. Everybody would go to the Supreme Court and say, look, I have the right to everything. And this is actually what the well-off people in Brazil and Colombia and many other countries are doing. They go to the court and they say, I want treatment according to these specifications because uh, I have the right to health. So there's no limits for that. But, but, but here's the opportunity. Um, I really like Tommy's slide on, on NICE International. I think before going to Mars, the British space shuttle actually went to Latin America uh, because uh, they had lots, lots of influence. Uh, and, and the way they did it, by putting information publicly available and out there, had a strong, so many countries said, hey, this is, looks really interesting. It's a great tool for us to do um, prior setting through health technology assessment. So Brazil, Colombia, Peru, Dominican Republic, Mexico, and many other countries are examples of countries that have created units of health technology assessment. But so far, much of that is being concentrated on priority setting, um, focusing on the assessment of drugs and medical devices and whether they are going to be financed by the public insurance system or not. So I think we have lots of opportunity that priority setting could influence other sets of policies, such as, for example, um, 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 clinical pathways and delivery platforms and certain things that the HTA movement hasn't been able to do so far. Say for Brazil, we have the right to everything according to our constitution. So, um, but, but, but how can actually the universal health system in Brazil decide whether is it better to finance braces and dental implants or congenital heart um, diseases um, surgeries? So um, I think that BCA can be an instrument and a tool to help uh, decide on what sequence this sort of, of, of benefits are going to be incorporated into a country benefits package. And I think that the experience that NICE and NICE International had in the region show that creating an institutional platform, putting a lot of information publicly available, it's a great opportunity and can have great leverage and power. So my last point is on institutional building, which I think that is a combination um, of opportunity barrier and a challenge. Um, so at the IDB, you know, we, we, we have focused a lot on the trying to overcoming the technical capacity issues by creating networks of knowledge and communities of practice. One is of something that we call the criteria network. In Spanish, it's something like, um, just a minute, the red criteria, because the red is, is network in Spanish, so it doesn't look, look it looks kind of communist, but anyway. Uh, so <laughs> the, the criteria network, we organize webinars, discussions, and, and it, it, it's amazing the amount of interest and participation that we have in these um, monthly meetings and the repository information that we have. And one of our main findings in during this network, in the works of this network, is that there's lots of interest in the institutional aspects of, okay, I'm convinced on the need to do that, but how actually do I build the institutions that are necessary to implement the after, um, which I think somebody mentioned here earlier in the panel. So I think that that's a very important point. Um, so um, I think that the way to guarantee the sustainability of this initiative here is to work and invest on the institutionalizing um, of these practices. Just to close up, I think that the development of reference case guidelines for benefit cost analysis is a very extremely invaluable endeavor for, um, for the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation um, as a way to decide how they're going to allocate their money and what the impact they're going to have on their investments. But I think that the foundation can have an even more powerful impact on health systems if it actually influences, uh, on the long run, the decision-making process of a larger ecosystem that includes uh, not just the analysts and practitioners, but also the ministries of finance and parliaments around the world. Thank you very much. Okay, so the last speaker before we open to general discussion is Jeremy Lauer from the World Health Organization. And I don't know how many times this is, you've experienced this, but we have six speakers in alphabetical order and L is at the bottom. <laughs> um, I have a set of three slides that I um, like to look at while I talk. Um, there we go. So what I wanted to focus on was really the question of barriers 
to you know, greater use and acceptability. And I think that you know, we have this typical frame where we say we need to think about what's the decision problem. We need to think about the policy. I mean, this is from Lisa's slide, the policy options, and uh, then the uh, perspective of the problem. And I'd kind of like to just turn that inside out because you know, in that slide down around level four or five, we got to looking at the accounting framework. And I think, let's just be for a second modest. This isn't rocket science, it's just accounting. We're just counting things up and we're valuing them. So you know, counting is something that's pretty simple that is intuitively appealing to a lot of people that aren't economists. Economists try to make it hard. So let's make counting simple. Uh, and let's start with really what is our accounting framework? What are the quantities of things, the cues that we're interested in? And they can be benefits or they can be costs. But let's enumerate those cues. And I think it's useful to enumerate them in terms of those that are direct benefits or direct costs and those that are indirect benefits or indirect costs. And in another dimension, those that are market valued and those that are non-market valued. And I think on that level, we already have the effectiveness model. We have the logical framework of how the outcome is related to the inputs. And so a lot of things get clear right there. And I think, I'll, you know, I also want to just mention I'm very sensitive to, I mean, I'm sympathetic to Anil's comments about not having a very fixed view about what is our causal model. I think that's a very good point. But in terms of this framework, we set down what are our you know, costs, those things that are inputs and required to achieve the outcome. And then what are those things that are benefits, those quantities that are uh, the things that we want to achieve. And I don't know if I have this here. Let's see. So, and in doing that, I think we already have a very useful frame for leading about the discussion uh, and making it transparent and acceptable. And this is related very much to what Dean said about the dashboard. You know, you can have things on that table that you think are important, but for various reasons, you're not able to count accurately. And I think that's also a useful exercise. It's just a way of getting on the table what is in your dashboard of importance than what's in your dashboard of counting. Maybe somebody could advance that slide for me, sorry. Um, And then, I mean, by the way, everything I said on the first slide applies to any economic evaluation. There's nothing there that's BCA specific. When we get to BCA, we start having to talk about prices. And I think we should actually ban the use of monetary, monetized, and similar phrases. What we should talk about are either prices or opportunity cost because we really don't care about the monetary value per se, other than it's a convenient source of, it, uh, of attributing prices. So I think that terminology is very unhelpful, at least in the health community where, I, where, I'm, where I'm speaking from. So let's not talk about money, monetized, monetary. Let's talk about opportunity cost and prices. And what is a price? It's a measure of an opportunity cost. Fundamentally, that's what it is. It comes from either preferences or technologies, but it's a measure of an opportunity cost. Everybody can understand an opportunity cost. What people don't understand is monetizing health, I promise you. So don't talk about that. Don't use those terms, monetary, monetized. Take them out. And prices, on the other hand, you know, deserve a discussion, just like the quantities deserve a discussion. And it has to have the same frame as the quantities. So then we have value of direct and value of indirect and market and non-market. Now, all of the mischief and uh, deviltry is really in the estimation of the shadow prices, the non-market prices. So they deserve a special discussion. Those are really important to be clear about the assumptions that we're making and the shortcuts that we're taking. And, I, and I'm fully sympathetic with what everybody said about the VSLs. By the way, that's my timer. <laughs> and um, can't turn it off. 
Uh, so once we've done that, then I think we have, you know, this setup for the final slide, which is really just taking the P's and multiplying them by the Q's. So if I could just have somebody kindly advance that final slide, I'll end there. And then we have our benefit cost analysis. So that's simple. Everybody can understand it. We don't have to talk about our decision problem, our decision maker, our perspective. We say, th these are the things that we're counting and that we think are important. By the way, those define the decision problem. They define the perspective. But start from there. It's like, you know, when we do proofs in Euclid, Euclid presents the proofs synthetically, right? You start from uh, postulates, and then you deduce things. Nobody's mind works like that. We start, we use think analytically. We think from the result that we want to achieve and then work back to the postulates. And so this is a similar kind of shift of perspective, turning it inside out from a synthetic kind of deductive approach to analytically looking at where we want to go and why we think it's important. And then the perspective and the, the decision problem and everything will fall out of that. And you know, then there's useful decision kind of conversation we can have about that. But that's really what I think would, would reduce barriers, is thinking about what is our accounting framework, what are the Qs, what are the Ps, multiply them together, end of story. Thank you. Thank you. So I think our uh, six speakers have put a lot of good topics on the table for us. Let's open it up to discussion. And um, we have a bunch of microphones here for panelists. And I will try and call on people. And so, yes, uh, Lisa in the back. Thanks. Troy Scott, Research Triangle Institute. One uh, theme I've heard a lot this morning, I think, is that <clears throat> to, to place some common denominator metric on different outcomes, or, or a monetary value, uh, if you will, with apologies to, to Jeremy, uh, depends on, on values. And I think we can probably all agree that, that values differ. So I wonder if it's useful to think of our job as practitioners of benefit cost analysis, not as uh, uh, prescribing uh, best policy or, or uh, presenting one ranking of, of policies, but to provide policymakers with a, a quantitative framework that maps from values to policy preferences so that they can say, you, know, you could say to policymakers, if these are your values, then these are the preferred uh, policies, understanding that, that different people uh, looking at the same <clears throat> very transparent benefit cost analysis, because they might disagree about what values attach to what outcomes, might still have different policy preferences. Responses? Pick that up. <laughs> well, let me just... name was <laughs> so my point uh, about, you know, I agree that prices are values. They're a measure of values. But they're values that come out, you know, of preferences and they come out of production technologies. I don't, that, that, that's where the fundamental notion of opportunity cost arises. I don't think we need to confuse that with a discussion about monetizing. That's all. That's the point I'm trying to make there. Um, I think that probably the only really normative judgment that is involved in applying a shadow price to a non-market benefit or cost is the, the judgment in deciding whose values that do we use. Because there's often an implicit assumption that individual values, when average, represent social values. I think that's a normative judgment. I think there's nothing normative per se about applying values to non-market benefits or costs. Nothing at all. There's nothing normative about that. That's just a fact of the world because it comes out of preferences and it comes out of technologies, those opportunity costs. So there's nothing normative about that. The normative part is whose values. I'd just like to add, uh, Kareen Nyborg, who's a professor at University of Oslo, has written a very nice book on 
risk-benefit cost analysis broadly, but she makes the point that you want to do an analysis that people with different normative perspectives will find useful. So if your analysis is too narrowly constrained by your normative perspective, lots and lots of readers will just reject it as not relevant. So then the things like the accounting framework Jeremy put forward, the sensitivity analysis Dean put forward, sort of lots of presentation that shows the raw outputs as well as how you combine them in different ways can be very useful even to people who disagree with some steps of how you carry out the monetization or the pricing. Other comments? I, I just want to build upon a comment that Calypso made that the uh, the public sector willingness to pay might be <coughs> excuse me, might be lower than uh, a willingness to pay based upon individual uh, preferences. And I think that's true. Uh, and I think it's really important, actually. I think it has implications for the foundation in, in the way that it does its uh, economic evaluations. So if you look at the way that NICE makes its decisions in UK in, the, in its economic guidance, it's very clear that that willingness to pay threshold is based upon a measure of the opportunity cost. And the UK is ahead of a lot of other countries in having actually done some empirical evidence into measuring that shadow price. You know, what is the opportunity cost when the NHS spends limited healthcare resources here rather than here. So the work that Claxton and colleagues did a couple of years ago estimated it to be about £13,000 per quality, and we can argue about their assumptions, but ultimately there will be some cost per quality that represents the shadow price. So it's no good then taking an individual, uh, you know, an estimate of willingness to pay based on individual preferences and saying, well, it's far higher than that. You know, maybe it's 50,000 or 100,000 pounds per quality. So let's accept technologies with ICE as far in excess of 13,000 pounds because that 13,000 pounds is it's not normative. It is an actual, <laughs> like, whether you like it or not, every 13,000 pounds you spend at the margin will displace a quality. And if you value a quality at 100,000 or a million or whatever value you want to put on it, if you're adopting a technology with an ICE above 13,000, you're probably going to displace more qualities than you gain, and you should value those qualities you lose <laughs> at a million or whatever value you want to place on it. Perhaps even more, that discussion we had earlier about the, the willingness to accept maybe being higher. But this is absolutely fundamental. And given that the foundation has a limited budget, there are things it would like to do but cannot do. It's absolutely critical that they have some understanding of what that opportunity cost is, whether that's in terms of health, or in terms of health and non-health outcomes. It doesn't matter what that outcome measure is, you need to understand the opportunity cost. And this has equity implications. Because if you accept, if, go back to NICE for a moment, if they were to accept a technology with an ISA far in excess of 13,000, they're gonna displace more qualities than they gain. Those qualities that are being displaced are in, <coughs> excuse me, are in other patients. There are other patients affected who will be losing health. And the moment that we start bringing in non-health outcomes, this consideration of opportunity cost becomes a lot more complex because it's no longer just health that we're foregoing, right? It's, it's very simple to say, well, we gain qualities and we lose qualities. The moment we say, well, it's not just qualities, we actually care about all sorts of non-health outcomes. Well, you need to start caring about them in those individuals who bear the opportunity cost because they're not just losing health, they're now losing non-health outcomes as well. And they're individuals and if you don't consider the non-health opportunity costs, then you're now breaching the principle of horizontal equity because you're not treating individuals with similar characteristics in a similar way. So this is an incredibly complex issue. So my question is one of real pragmatism. Does the foundation understand the opportunity cost of the decisions that it's making? Can it consider those in terms of health outcomes? Or is it pragmatic to consider non-health outcomes as well? And if not, there's a real risk of making inequitable decisions there. I'm certainly not answering on part of the foundation, but, uh, but, but I certainly agree with you that from my perspective, we're talking about how should public funds be spent uh, and the individual perspective of what's best for an individual is not the sort of perspective that I find uh, attractive. And that's what you were saying earlier about welfareist, extra welfareist. And, and if you have that issue, then what you're saying is really important. And uh, just, just a, a slight reflection is that I think most cost effectiveness analysis and cost benefit analysis has been a little bit disingenuous in saying, not spelling out what are the opportunity cost of implementing what 
that you say are cost effective and and this is going to be more important for the gates foundation or for intersectoral things because what are you giving up by spending more on health which the implication of some of this work is and and that's why i tried to come back to the methods because i don't think that the methods of cost benefit analysis are fair to the other sectors that you're trying to take money from and so what would the gates foundation be giving up if it takes money from education or poverty reduction to spend more on health the techniques i don't think are there to to answer that question, but you'd want to answer that question. And that's what a Ministry of Finance or the Parliament or whoever needs to be trying to answer. Um, so yeah, someone else can answer on what whether the Gates is aware of this. Other, other responses here? And so just to reiterate, what we're about here is trying to talk about benefit cost analysis in the large, not only for the Gates Foundation, of course. For the Gates, Gates Foundation, cost effectiveness is a consideration, but it's certainly not the main driver of how we spend our money. Uh, there are many, many considerations, and uh, you know, we often think about what is the, you know, what are the risks? What are the, the big risks that nobody else is willing to pay? Uh, maybe some big global goods, the development of a new vaccine that nobody else can uh, really can take the risk to afford to, to try to invest in that. Gates is willing to, to take that risk. This is a, an, another big driver, and maybe you're not going to uh, do that based on a purely a cost-benefit analysis, but risk and cost-effectiveness are some of the key drivers behind what we try to promote in some of the decisions. Uh, the development of these benefit-cost analysis reference cases is to support our rigor in providing some guidance in that decision-making, but more than that, it's, to for, for, it's a global good to support all of you um, in the development of your methodologies as you, in each of your sectors and in health, um, health departments and in non-health departments uh, in governments. I think that, uh, I think that uh, our task can be made a little easier if we, if we Anchor it in fundamentals, certain 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 core fundamentals, and and the fundamentals here are that uh, resources are scarce, so that if you use uh, the resources in uh, one area, those resources are not available in other areas. That's one. Number two, I think it's also very important, though uh, maybe we are downplaying this, that. We look at the context. The context, I think, is very, very important. So that uh, when we are doing a BCA, we should not say that we, sh we shouldn't think that uh, it, it, it's a one thing. I think we look. We need to look at the context, and then we also need to look at the fact that there are alternatives. I think that's very important. So that when we are characterizing the opportunity costs, we should characterize opportunity costs as the benefits that we give up when we choose one path. So it's important that we be clear about the options that we have, because that will help us to correctly characterize the opportunity cost. And then the context is also very important. So. When we do those things, then I believe that we can uh, uh, make some headway. <laughs> Comment? No. Um, wait, is somebody going to respond? Because there's another question over here. Yeah, no. Okay. Take the next question, I think. But I think this gentleman over here is next. Yeah, Thomas Foy is here from the Gates Foundation. So thank you very much for, for all of the input this morning. That was extremely uh, enlightening for me. One, one of the questions that I'm still struggling with is uh, this, this question of prices and, and conversions. Because I, I completely agree with, with the gentleman here in terms of I understand opportunity cost in health. And I know that if I'm taking a DALI from here to give it to somebody else, this is something that as a uh, a decision maker, it's relatively simple. But the moment I'm starting to look at, in on the one hand, health, 
versus education, I have basically a, a, a conversion problem. And my problem is that I, I think the question of price is really important, but the, the problem that I'm having is understanding how we can use prices without uh, just uh, perpetuating the choices that have been made in the past. Because what we're trying to do is inside change. And if we're just looking at what has been the choices that have been made by systems in terms of allocating money to education versus health versus something else, and if this basically is whatever is the framework that we're using in terms of willingness to pay, etc., if this is the, the basis for the conversion from one matter, such as DALIs, to another matter, such as education, I, I think we're missing the point. The point is a point of what is our relative preference versus what is the benefit from education in terms of this educational inherent benefit versus a daddy. And so my, my, my question is, it feels like we're talking about a lot of things, but the, 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 the problem that I'm having is how do we establish those prices? How do we establish those relative prices between one daddy and one, uh, whatever is the benefit of education or in, in increased, increased earning potential. And it feels like we're turning around the problem without really addressing it in some ways. Well, can, can I, uh, I, I think, I mean, there's different types of prices as well. I mean, there's at least two or three here because there's the mar sort of market prices and we're all, I guess, accepting that there are, I mean, the, the, the situations under which market prices in healthcare markets or even education markets actually remotely reflect um, you know marginal social opportunity or or, or benefit opportunity cost of benefit are, are extremely strict and, and usually don't apply i mean you know but so so we move beyond that then i think you were talking about shadow prices and there's a question about how these are derived and uh, there's some bad uh, examples in the past that, that, that this whole process was hijacked by libertarians to, to demonstrate shadow prices that, that that, that serve political, basically, objectives. That's why people are, are a bit suspicious. Then there's the uh, what a colleague mentioned about what Nice is trying to do, sort of the de facto, the the, the empirical uh, uh, productivity of a healthcare system, sort of the revealed willingness to pay off society, revealed through the allocation of a certain amount of money to health versus education versus whatever. That's not normative. It's it's there. It, the decision was made year on year, and the question then is whether who the end client is for this work. If the end client is Bill Gates who has a lot of money and he wants to, uh, he can afford to be aspirational and change priorities, certainly within the way he spends his own money, I think that's one thing. If the question is, can we get a Minister of Finance to allocate, which is what uh, uh, David was talking about, a Minister of Finance to, to put more, more in health because of the extra value, aspirational value that Bill Gates or we or you or somebody else thinks that, uh, uh, surgery or leukemia for children in children or whatever has versus education that's that's a completely different story uh, because that would have obviously had to carry budgetary implications and affordability then matters so some people can afford to be aspirational some cannot and there's different types of prices um, so it depends what whose budget you're thinking about at least that's what I think Okay, um, I'm, I think I might be shifting gears just a touch, but I wanted to follow up on something that Anil and David said, and I'm sort of combining a few things. So um, on, on sort of looking at that cost side, in addition to the emergence of sort of innovation and technology, actually what we see in a lot of settings is um, innovation in the, the delivery of services and certainly working across sectors. So notably, um, more recently, there and it's not just in nutrition, but there have been actually calls for multi-sectoral strategies. The, um, the, the DFID, World Bank, African Development Bank are all moving in that direction. And so in the field, certainly of nutrition, the DALI fails miserably. Um, I think there are other probably areas like zoonotic um, vector control where this would be the case as well. And so I guess I'm wondering what is the opportunity um, so to David's point, I think there is actually a demand within health for improved methods and guidance on um, resource allocation across intersectoral investments. Um, and I would say nutrition is one of those where there is a demand, um, even though sometimes they don't think they're in the health sector. <laughs> um, 
And so um, I guess the question is, how do we, um, you know, what, what's the opportunity there? And then more importantly, I think we have a challenge of measuring effectiveness um, of inter multi-sectoral strategies on health outcomes. And, and so to date, what people do is they gather all the individual studies to see if they're cost effective or not, and then they try to combine them together. And you know, it's, it's an impossible task. So that's on the effectiveness side. On the cost side, there are all these efforts right now trying to get a handle on the costs associated with um, improving nutrition across sectors. And that's also been challenging. Okay. Uh, uh, no, I, I completely agree with you. I mean, I, I don't think uh, uh, that was a good point, and I don't think there was a question in your <laughs> question. Uh, I, I couldn't agree more with you. I think when we talk about opportunity cost uh, of, mul of putting money in one sector versus another, uh, what one often misses, and, and I think you alluded to this in the case of nutrition, is the synergies that often are uh, operating across these sectors. Uh, and nutrition is a classic case of, of uh, an intervention that yeah, has there's lots of synergies going on in, in nutritional outcomes with investments in nutrition, and in investments in health, investments in uh, women's education, and all that. So, I mean, some of these synergies we often miss accounting for. Uh, and, and so the whole notion of what is the opportunity cost of investing in, in this versus that is often uh, uh, somewhat biased because we have missed some of those larger synergies across the sectors. So I, I would wholeheartedly agree with you. That's, that's an important issue. Maybe just a small comment on the cost side. Uh, and I think the costs of doing intersectoral or multi-sectoral uh, uh, actions, I think, are massively underestimated for some of the reasons that you say, that that uh, people look at experiments that have been done by donors or by people in developing countries and just assume that if you implement them in a, in a country, you can do it for similar sorts of prices. And talking to someone from Jamaica who set up the early childhood development program there, that the they had to set up... A, an agency to do that and to try and coordinate between the various ministries that there were about six or seven of them involved. And uh, and that was really complex because line item ministries or, or line sector in ministries have education, wants to pursue education, health wants to improve health, and getting them to think of ways of doing these things collectively. So the cost side actually is very high. Uh, to implement it. Now, the benefits are, as you say, uh, complex to measure as well because there's all of the different components. But um, but I think that the underestimation of the costs of many of these interventions is, is something that we need to deal with, but it's generic to cost effectiveness or cost benefit. I just wanted to make a comment about the trade-off between health and education. I think it's 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 an important preoccupation and it's not an accident that we have you know specialized UN agencies that deal with health and education respectively I mean these are what Sen calls you know fundamental capabilities one way of describing what that means is that they are both direct and indirect benefits the more education more health you have the better your life is regardless of every other dimension of well-being and there are arguably things like agency, aspects of human rights that fall into that same category. The more you have, the better your life is, regardless of anything else. But they also are instrumental in achieving all the other things that you want to have, like you know, income and families and social relationships. So that's a very, very important fact to focus on. And I'll just leave you with a, a final remark of, of, of Amartya Sen's. He said that the more education people have, the more health they demand. But it doesn't work the other way. The healthier you, you are, you don't necessarily demand more education. So I think that's an interesting observation. Yeah, hello, uh, Lou Garrison again. Um, so I'm going to ask two questions, then I'm going to talk after that for a while, <laughs> okay? <laughs> but, but the questions I want you to comment on are, uh, 
I think you all agree with Dean that if we're going to do these intersectoral and Gates is funding intersectoral projects, that benefit cost analysis, trying to, and I'm sorry, Jeremy, I have to, I'm okay with monetize, okay? So that we've got to monetize these things and then we can do those comparisons. We can't really do the, we can't do dallies in education, qualities in education. So if we're going to do those, we have to monetize. But does, so my question is, do you, do you all fundamentally agree that, that Gates should be using more benefit cost analysis as a tool and then maybe society more generally? And second, the second question is, does that, what do you think that means for, for Peter Newman's 4,000 cost utility estimates that are in the Tufts database? Okay, so we have, you know, this is the 40th anniversary of uh, uh, Milt Weinstein and Bill Stason's article, ad, you know, kind of developing the quality. Okay, so that's 40 years ago. 20 years ago, we had, uh, you know, Garber and Phelps write the paper showing you could derive a cost per quality threshold from welfare economics. We had the first panel advocate with Milt and, you know, start the leaders of the field at the time advocate for the cost per quality. And here we are in America 20 years later, and we've outlawed the cost per quality at PCORI and Medicare. We, you know, so we kind of outlawed, outlawed the use of the tool in certain sectors, yet you can go to the Office of Management and Budget and you can get a value of life. They have a, they'll have that, or the ACIP will use all the tools that NICE uses when they do vaccines. So we're very pluralistic, to put it, or inconsistent, depending on your point of view. So, you know, so we're doing, all, so we have this at the same time, and this is, we, the, in the last few years, a number of value frameworks have been promulgated in the U.S. The oncologist said, here's, val here's how we should define value for our patients. The cardiologist said, well, we should use cost effectiveness to help us divide, to do clinical pathways, you know, which is important. And then we have this, the advent of ICER, which is kind of a privately supplied NICE, which basically says, and they're using the cost per quality just like NICE does. That's the framework they're using. And then we have a few other entities. So, so we have all these come out. And so the, at, the, at the International Society for Pharmacological Economics, we formed a task force a year ago. And we got Milt Weinstein, uh, uh, Phelps, Chuck Phelps, Danzen, uh, you know, uh, Mike Drummond, Adrian Taus. And so we're grappling, we're, we're, and we've just written our draft report, which, is on, which will be on the website and be posted for comment. So they were grappling with, well, what do we tell people? You know, they're getting all these value frameworks, and we focus on the U.S. value frameworks. They're hearing all this about value. They're getting all these frameworks. What can we do? What can we recommend? Now, you know, we have preliminary recommendations. My, you know, in some ways, I think the base case is, you know, we think that in general, for certain kinds of decisions, the cost per quality is a useful tool. Works better for new medicines than it does for, say, a, a general internist versus a GP or other aspects of technology. But it's a useful tool, and in, its, uh, in the U.S., we should use it more. But at the same time, it ignores certain things like extended cost-effectiveness analysis, the value of financial risk protection, and other kinds of uh, things related to uncertainty, and that we should have methods. You know, we need to bring those in. We need to think about those other things to sort of build on the quality, but we shouldn't throw it out. We should add those in. But then the question is the aggregation question that comes up. So if you can't monetize them easily or put them in the, in the health state description and get them through utility, then how do you do it? How do you add them in there? Now, there's a lot of discussion about multi-criteria decision analysis. And Pearson has tried a couple of experiments on that, certainly been used in other places. So anyway, that's kind of, I wanted to make you aware of that, of that effort that's going and, and encourage people to comment on that. But my questions are, well, where do you all stand on benefit cost analysis? And what does it mean for cost per quality and cost per dolly work? I can address the first part. I mean, obviously, I think uh, if you want to compare investments across sectors, there, you have no choice. I mean, you have to do BCA. Now, uh, how exactly you define the benefits is, is a formidable challenge, as you said. There are many, many uh, uh, non-economic benefits that you, you sort of, uh, that are quite difficult to uh, translate into monetary value. Uh, but you have to do the BCA in order to do intersectoral comparisons. I mean, I several people of us in this room, we were just talking, uh, Dale Whittington and I were just talking during the break about the Copenhagen consensus. Uh, both of us were involved in that, and, and I think Dean was, and several of you uh, in this room were involved with the Copenhagen consensus. And, and uh, that had really captured people's imagination, because uh, if you want to say, uh, how does putting a dollar in micronutrient supplementation, how does that compare to putting a dollar uh, in um, 
saving a polar bear. Uh, I mean, that's the only way you can uh, talk about those two investments and and the relative uh, appeal of of doing one versus the other. So there's at the bottom line is if you want to compare across sectors, you have to do VCA, but but it's uh, it's more complicated than that. Yeah, maybe maybe I'm a sort of dissenter in a way. Um, I would not personally do benefit cost analysis for intrasectoral. sectoral. I don't see that it adds any value and the, again, personal. Um, and I think the for low and middle income countries, the assumptions which you need to use to get uh, a value of the health benefit are so far from the reality of how markets work in those countries that the numbers are picked out of a hat, essentially. Um, and so that's an extreme version to stimulate discussion. But for the intersectoral, uh, I can see that, yes, as Anil says, it's the only thing we have. But again, I think we don't have the methods even for the Copenhagen consensus of really accurately valuing the non-health parts of it, because I think that the intrinsic value of education, the intrinsic value of arts and science, the intrinsic value of polar bears, uh, whatever, are not captured by the way benefit cost analysis is done. And I think that, again, for low and lower and middle income countries, the, the way benefit cost analysis is done needs some more work to try and value the outcomes. Um, so it's a qualified, from my personal perspective, a qualified use of it for, for intersectoral, um, but other people will obviously have other views. Yeah, um, I, I agree. I think that a stronger case needs to be made for using um, BCA intrasectoral. So we need to, okay, uh, perhaps there are other reasons which we haven't gotten so far, but I think that with the platform that has been developed um, over the last um, 20 years or so, um, and the amount of information out there, and the, the cost that it takes to train the analyst and to put information um, out there. So I was mentioning the experience. So many countries, they just tend to, um, low and middle income countries, to copy the guidelines that others um, have. Um, and that partly explains why um, a nice decision to put it everything away um, publicly available had such a strong impact. So, so I think that, that we need to do our own cost-benefit analysis here, whether it is cost-beneficial to move from one platform to the other, especially when we're trying to influence a broader setting of governments and ministries and so on. One thing is to um, have it internally, the foundation use it as a criteria to um, inform their decisions. And another thing is to um, imagine and think about the, the, the difficulties um, that um, ministries um, in low and middle income countries have. I, I would agree with, I don't know, I, I, if I understood what you said, I think, I think it's valuable. Cost benefit analysis has a place. Um, certainly for the foundation makes sense and for governments or whoever else, whatever decision makers want to see, or advocates want to expose sort of the, the comparative costs and benefits of different things that go beyond health. That doesn't mean we, we must get rid of the dahlia or the quality. I don't see how the two are linked. Uh, one can continue doing what we're doing in health. I think specifically for health, to move to cost-benefit analysis would be, uh, would be difficult, and I'm not sure where the demand stems from. I mean, why should we do it? Who's asking for it for health in particular? And as you say, assuming we have a threshold that's realistic and that's calibrated by the budgetary and other non-budgetary constraints, and usually that, that, that's hard, it's a big ask. So it's not that it's happening, you usually need to acknowledge that. And in that sense, both BCA and cost effectiveness analysis suffer, but that's where it comes to the decision rule effectively. Uh, but assuming that, then there's no problem. You come up with net benefit. Um, from, from the quality of the DALI, assuming you, you have the appropriate threshold to multiply by. So I just, uh, I just think that it would be unhelpful, especially in light of the movement towards universal coverage, which is important. Uh, and, and this idea that underpins that being health maximization, 
to come out and say we should monetize everything because that's how it's going to be perceived. It doesn't matter whether we use the word monetize or not. And, and I think that's not necessarily helpful. But it doesn't mean you shouldn't do BCA. It just means we can, it can be complementary. Just had a couple of words. Um, well, I agree with all the others. Uh, I, I think that from the Gates Foundation point of view, uh, BCA is, uh, is a tool uh, that may provide uh, the information that they need uh, um, to, to, to prioritize uh, across different sectors. I'm not sure this is always the case uh, for, for all the governments uh, from countries of various level of, of income. I don't see uh, we'll, uh, we stop use uh, um, DALIs and QUALIs in, in the near term for a number of, of reasons, particularly, for example, because I don't see that we start uh, evaluating the, the burden of disease uh, in terms of, uh, uh, of voluntary uh, terms. But I would like to use uh, uh, my, my 30 seconds a little bit to expand on, on one point you made, I think, that's the multi-criteria decision uh, uh, making. And I think uh, that that's something that should play a bigger role in, uh, in decision making. So uh, benefit cost analysis or cost effective analysis or other uh, forms of the economic analysis should be uh, linked, uh, increasingly linked to other criteria. Affordability, for example, uh, is uh, is one of uh, um, of the criteria. Um, political palatability, if you want, you know, the capacity of implementing uh, the intervention itself. It's not uh, sufficient that intervention is uh, provides a good return of investment, but it's something that. Uh, could be also implemented in uh, in the country. So I think that uh, beyond the benefit cost analysis or economic analysis, we, we should also pay attention to multi-criteria decision making. So, Ms. Trudy now. Uh, Trudy Cameron, the University of Oregon. I'm an environmental economist. I've been sitting here thinking I've been observing another slow motion collision between two fundamentally different philosophical perspectives. Uh, if you've, I never studied philosophy before I discovered this, so uh, a lot of the cost effectiveness stuff seems to come out of a deontological perspective, and um, the economic willingness to pay side seems to come more from a teleological or consequentialist perspective. Now, uh, if you're deontological, you believe in intrinsic values, I've heard that word today, um, categorical imperatives, doing things because they're the right thing to do. Uh, economy, that works great if everybody agrees on the intrinsic values involved. Uh, economists tend to subscribe to the more pragmatic, uh, consequentialist approach. You do it if it works towards a goal, and it's just pragmatic because uh, you've got to do something. So uh, I encourage us all to think carefully out words. The first thing I heard today was that all lives have equal value. I think we've got to translate that. I think what that means is that everyone is equally deserving of good health and long life. Value is a, a really tricky word. Uh, it means something different to everybody. Uh, I would agree that everyone deserves an equal amount of good health and long life if it's a complete gift, if it's being provided to them without opportunity costs. The resources that were used to provide that had no possible other use. Uh, as soon as you admit for some other use of those resources, you've got a problem. Uh, one of my favorite analogies is to, uh, rather than thinking about gifts of health or longevity, um, everybody gets a car, right? Um, if Oprah had uh, handed out cars to everyone and had differentiated those cars according to people's income. The rich people got Mercedes and the poor people got 20-year-old Toyota Corollas. Uh, we would have thought ill of her for discriminating in this gift, right? Everybody d would deserve an equal car. No opportunity cost, right? She wouldn't have spent that money on anything else. But as soon as you say everybody gets a car, it's a $30,000 car for everyone, but you also have to pay for the car, whether you like it or not. Um, that's sort of what happens when we start doing public policy. We divert resources, we cause people to give up things either directly to pay for them or by not providing other stuff that we would otherwise provide for them. It so sounds really fair and wonderful that everybody deserves a $30,000 car until you make them pay for that car. And that's where the benefit cost analysis has to come into the story. No way around it. So the value, I also heard the word um, value of life over here. Don't say that. <laughs> You might say value of statistical life by a diatribe from the Review of Environmental Economics and Policy from 2010, where I tried to explain it all because I got so tired of seeing the bonfires in the press about statistical lives. It's not what you think it is. Okay. Yeah. 
Pete, thanks. Um, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I, I mean, this was the point I was trying to make. If, if, if I come, you know, to, the, to Latin America, in, in, in the terms, we, we, we know, you know, the way uh, Dean um, put it earlier, okay, value statistical life is just the, 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 the marginal cost for, uh, for accepting a different risk. So, I mean, this is, this is something that's completely different from the, 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 the value of statistical life phrase implies. Right, so a small change in your um, risk and your probability um, of, of improving your, or worsening your health and how much you're willing to pay for it. So uh, that's what I was uh, implying when I was saying uh, we have to be careful with the words we communicate. I know that these things have you know, a long pedigree in the literature and so on and people have uh, you know, <laughs> vested interest. No, I created the term and so on. Um, but, but I think it matters a lot. It matters a lot and, and if you're trying to propose a framework, um, then you have to be mindful in how it's going to be received. Um, and when we're talking about health, uh, so it, strong constituents, strong stakeholders, and I think they're going to actually have um, a, a big impact. So, so that's why I was thinking that we should um, try to um, either come up with different way to phrase it, or it's not hiding things, you know, that's, but, but, but on, on the contrary, it's making things more clear and more explicit, because otherwise it leaves to people the interpretation of, oh yes, the value of statistical life means, you know, how much my value or somebody else's, yes. Thank you. <laughs> um, so we, we, we will talk about that issue this afternoon. Let me just announce, I've been given my directions here. We have four people on the list, and then we will break for lunch by 12.15. So next on the list is Richard. Um, I'm Richard Carson. I'm an economist at the University of California, San Diego. And um, I work on benefit cost analysis and have done so in environmental areas, transport, urban, crime. I've actually done some work in health and education or whatever. And it, it seems like a lot of the health economic, not health economics, a lot of the health <laughs> policy is in some sense uh, bizarre and not counting sort of the effects that flow from health interventions. And so I, the usual standpoint that I would take is let's think about a randomized controlled trial in the field. And we can take either the nutrition example that was raised earlier, we could take a vaccine program. And what you would want to do is actually quantify all the effects that flow from that and then try to assign in some fashion uh, value or importance or whatever to all of those effects. I mean, this is in some sense, if you were to look at the criminal justice system and you don't take into account the impacts on people's future earnings, by putting them into jail. I mean, it, it seems like this is a strange thing to do and that there's, in some sense, no way to avoid trying to quantify the importance of a whole bunch of disparate effects. And if we thought about the nutrition program or the vaccine program, you know, qualities or dollies might actually be one of the outputs of those programs. But it seems crazy to ignore all the things that might flow from that. Uh, I mean, it seems to get away from one of the basic reasons that people engage in health interventions. Uh, if you ever sit down with parents of children, I mean, they'll tell you all these things. Uh, so it does seem like we're substituting, you know, this is, this is where Jim brought up consumer surplus and, and listening to people, the, the, the notion of how I aggregate across people is very different from not respecting people's individual preferences and taking those into account as part of the decision-making process. I've had, I've had uh, when I used to work at NICE, I've had lots of, and I'm sure Tom perhaps when he worked at Pharmac and then NICE, discussions with uh, industry who said exactly that. Now the question is, we start valuing all these wonderful things beyond health. Where is the money going to come from? Um, is it going to come from the Department of Health? Is it going to be the National Health Service that's paying for everybody's gains in productivity and happiness and uh, all, all the rest? 
I mean, it's, I agree with you, but where is the money coming from? I don't know. Those competing intervention. Anyway, there, the question is not where the money's coming from. That's always important with any public decision. But it's the fact that you've got competing interventions that have different sets of effects. And if you're not looking at the entire set of effects flowing from an intervention, then even within the health sector, you can't make good judgments on what you're doing. I mean, it's still there's going to be competition between you know, the people who build highways in the health ministry. And, but even if you've got the health ministry, they're the ones implementing the vaccine program. But they're picking, they're choosing the vaccine program over some other program that's going to have a set of effects. And I don't see how you can avoid looking at the set of effects, the entire set of effects that flow from it. And that's why I think if you step back and think about this as a randomized control trial that has a long-term set of effects that flow from that, of which qualities or dollies would be one, then you have to say, even if I, you know, just within the health ministry's actions, I've got to know what else is going on. hardly have our cities to, 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 to allow us to conclude how many qualities we get three years down the line because most of them stop six months after they've started. So there's also an issue about evidence and then you start making things up and then you start attaching prices and then you're asking the National Health Service to pay for them. Hence, by law, NICE has to look at the NHS perspective alone. Now you could change that and have the societal perspective like the US panel. But the question remains that once you start monetizing this, then you'll have Pfizer telling you look at my drug, because I'm assuming when this child becomes 35, they'll become, I don't know, um, NASA scientists and their lives are so, you know, they'll be so super productive and therefore you should pay for the, it's not, it does happen. That's the, where do you stop? It's, that's why the decision problem matters as well. If I could just comment. So if you do it from a social perspective, if values are estimated correctly, the people are saying, I would prefer to ex exchange this amount of money for this benefit. So that's where the money comes from. And if the values are not estimated accurately, that could be the root of this problem. But Dean. Um, so I'd like to um, return a little bit to the value for intrasectoral discussion of aggregate measures, qualities, tallies, and do that with uh, um, awareness that the creator of this whole uh, Don Shepard and uh, Richard Zickhauser uh, sitting close by here. Um, yes, there are lots and lots of outcomes with, and, and we have prices for hundreds of, probably hundreds of thousands of outcomes. And the standard way of thinking about it, opportunity cost is to um, aggregate quantities with prices and you get an opportunity cost expressed in um, dollars. So that's one way to go in health, and it's got its shortcomings because some of the things we care about in health aren't marketed, so we don't have market prices, including mortality. Um, the other kind of extreme is to look at age-specific mortality rates, perhaps by cause, and um, then look at the relatively small number of conditions for which there's a large disability component relative to the mortality component. It's, it's not large, but it's important. Um, and just keep track of all those separately, a great big dashboard. Um, and then the intermediate is a quality or a dally, which tries to aggregate those health outcomes. And, and the question, that, one question I think this reference case needs to deal with, and um, that isn't completely obvious to me, is just how valuable is that intermediate aggregation between the real fine disaggregation of the burden of disease community and the super aggregation of the economics community. And to me, that depends a lot on how much you're really aggregating in the middle. Now, I don't think the health system is actually all that complicated in the range of things it produces. It reduces adult deaths, it reduces child deaths, and it 
re reduces a certain amount of severe distress, more or less three things. And why we can't keep track of those separately? What's the cost of reducing a child mortality rate? What's the cost of reducing the adult mortality rate? What's the cost of reducing severe distress? Keep track of those three separately. We don't have to have the whole um, ICD-10 with its 2,000 pages of diseases. We can knock it down to just a few things. So my sense is that from a, a substantive point of view, we really no longer need to have these aggregate measures. But then what is their value? Because obviously there's a, a strong sense of value. And I think their, their great value is precisely in their lack of transparency. And I'm, I'm quite serious about that. What, what the Quali or Dali does is obscure completely to the politician and even to the analyst the fact that we're saying that saving a 40-year-old is worth twice as much as saving a 70-year-old. We know what happens when that hits the press uh, in the US. So um, the, the genius of this intermediate level of aggregation is to obscure everything that's going on in a way that actually isn't too detrimental to policy making. <laughs> Jackson, oh, why don't we um, take the next, so Tommy Wilkinson. Um, uh, so just just a reflection, I guess, and, and this, this question about CBA or, or um, CEA, um, this idea that you're not getting two opposing worlds sort of coming together and where that's going to cause some fundamental issues. Um, uh, and maybe if I can just give some two examples of problems we're working in, in South Africa right now um, that might help give sort of a bit of clarity on this in my position is that we're, we're both in the IDSI reference case and I, I assume in the BCA reference case, there's a lot of um, uh, disaggregation. So you're actually not focusing on just producing an ISO or producing a, is it this positive or negative uh, monetary value. You're presenting a lot of information to the decision maker and therefore a lot of these questions are answered by, uh, you know, the decision maker is, is, is sovereign. So one question that we're being asked is about, you know, uh, what, uh, what priority maternal interventions should we scale up? And we've done some work in saying, okay, antenatal corticosteroids for preterm pre labor versus antibiotics for a preterm rupture of membranes. And we've done some analysis, so it would be uh, protected lives saves 1,500 odd for the first intervention and 200 odd for the other intervention. And working through and saying, okay, the cost of a life year saved for the first intervention is 34 US dollars per life year saved, and the other is, is 30 US dollars for the life year saved. And breaking it down like that, that makes it easy for the decision maker to say, okay, I'm gonna choose this intervention over the other. The, inter the, the, the decision maker is not saying, I want a CEA or I want a CBA. They're asking me, I've got a problem to answer. There's a second question here. We're doing sugar sweetened beverage tax. Um, uh, so that'll, there'll be a taxation, there'll be a, hopefully a, a re reduced utilization of sugar, reduced obesity. On the other hand, there might be around 5,000 jobs lost in the sugar industry. Again, Treasury is saying, what should I do? In that case, uh, some disaggregated analysis of you know, the, the, the cost of the unemployment uh, versus the health gains is also useful. Um, and so if we're getting into this sort of academic question of who's right and wrong and is CBA or CA better, the decision maker will tell us and say, I've got a problem and then we need to have a lot of analytical tools at our disposal to answer that question. Um, and so Jeremy, you, you, you quoted it a lot and also you called for hum, um, humility and I was wondering, my question is, were you um, sort of challenging um, John Maynard Keynes who said if economists could manage to be seen as humble, competent people on the level of dentists, that would be absolutely splendid. And I imagine you agree, you agree with him on that occasion. Thanks. It's probably not a good time to say anything else, but I'll try to be really brief because I think Richard and, and then Tommy raised some of what I wanted to raise. But I'm, I, David, I'm, I'm thinking about some of the things that you were saying in particular um, about the intersectoral evaluations. And, you know, we, all, we are living, those of us, well, all of us who are working in development with the SDGs now. And so obviously there is some demand for some kinds of analyses or some kinds of techniques and tools that can help inform choices uh, to, uh, across a lot of different sectors. Um, and I, I, you've made, I think, the point that, that um, I think we probably all accept to some extent, and that's why we're here, which is that our current techniques are, are lacking. I mean, I'm pretty deeply unsatisfied with what I can turn to. And so when, when I do some work in the areas looking um, across sectors, 
it's 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 even Copenhagen consensus, which has thought a lot about these things, is is unsatisfying in a lot of ways. Um, it, I mean, in Good, better than nothing, but I don't think that most of us are satisfied. And just two quick examples. I mean, I think Carol's example about nutrition was very good. We're working on tobacco for um, the Framework Convention on Tobacco Control, which is now trying to go beyond just what can be done within the health sector, but go far beyond that to make the advocacy case for greater tobacco control. And there's a lot of political will behind that. So, of course, the political will determines a lot of, of, of what we have to think about as we are responding to policy requests. We're also beginning to think more about adolescent risk factors and risk factors for non-communicable diseases. And there's so many things outside of the health sector, obviously, that are affecting adolescents taking on risk early in life that manifest much later in life. So I guess I'm just sort of um, asking you, David, in a way, or maybe asking the, the body, um, you know, how, how much effort, given the challenges that Calypso has said about doing this type of stuff and making it real in a developing country context, how much effort should go into um, further evolving these tools. I mean, I think you said the techniques are not there yet. That's, you know, that's what I keep running into. I hope by the end of the day, we have an answer on how much effort should go into it or uh, what we would hope to get out of it, I guess. Um, and, and just one last point. A couple of us in the room, um, Lynn, Margaret, myself, were on an Institute of Medicine committee that published a report last year on economic evaluation for um, investments in, in families and, and children. It was very focused on U.S., but the, I think the big lesson, I don't know if the others will say anything, the big lesson from that was much more um, about the translation of this kind of work and how to make it relevant, what Tommy was, I think, just mentioning, than about the methods. We all get hot and bothered about the methods, and, and we're going to continue to do that, but you know, we shouldn't spend too much time on methods if we can't translate it and make it useful. Maybe seeing you asked me a direct question, I can start and then everyone else can put me right. Um, my, my wife often says that when I start a conversation with her, I come across as enormously negative. And uh, three days later, she realizes I was trying to be constructive. Uh, <laughs> but it was uh, three days of pain and irritation for her. <laughs> Um, so, so let me try and put the 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 the, the, the good side. I mean, I, I think that this is an opportunity to try and look more closely at the methods to see that many of the issues with cost benefit analysis that we all recognise, can we do better on that? And and I'm not sure whether the answer is yes, but I think we can try and get the intrinsic value of other sectors into it and see how that would be done. I think we need to do a lot better in developing countries with valuing the health outcomes uh, in ways that make sense. And uh, to me and to a lot of health economists working in developing countries, the way that the values have been put in don't make a lot of sense. And uh, and so is there better work we can do on that? And that's where I think that this, this work can make a difference. Just maybe I, I, I need to sort of think a little bit more about Dean's point because um, I, I think that the, in the intra-sectoral, the disaggregated one is useful. And as, as you said, for South Africa, you, you can get so far with it. But in the end, people have to compare when you've got a budget in the health sector and compare across them. And so Dean's two options for comparing is, is really which one is the best in this circumstances where neither is perfect. Um, and so I think that is the real question, you know, is the aggregation into dallies or qualities which has problems, is that better than an aggregation into a monetary value, sorry Jeremy, but a monetary value that many people don't think has any meaning whatsoever. Um, so that I think that's the question that we need to answer in this case. And uh, I, I don't pretend to have a full solution to that. You know, there's nothing that we can just say value, actually. It's enough just to say value, because that's what a price is. So we don't actually, there's nothing that we add to that word when we use the term monetary. We just talk about values. And it's important when we talk about values to understand that values and benefits, quantities of things, are different. So that's, that's the point. There's huge normative assumptions uh, that go with prices 
in, in healthcare markets. Are you going to ask the child or the parent how much they value being vaccinated? And then what are you going to do with that? So in terms I agree of the with quality you. I agree being with you. non-transparent, of course it is, and it's problematic, and as is the DALI. And, and, and we know that depending on what weights you pick, you get completely different answers, and absolutely. But how do you, can somebody explain to me how you derive in a transparent and meaningful way a shadow price of of like, how do you do it? Because I, I don't know. I mean, th therefore, that's where that's what you're comparing, as David said. How how much more transparent can you get and able to communicate if you go down the route of a an aggregate measure, it's been validated with all these problems and more methods work needed, versus trying to find this elusive price that doesn't yeah. exist. So uh, I mean, as I said, all the devilry and mischief is right there in estimating those prices. We agree about that. But I think we cloud the issue when we use the term monetary. Yeah. It's just a value. It's a price. It's an opportunity cost at base. Okay, any um, brief just final quick, words? Yeah, I totally agree with that. But um, when we're talking in Peru um, about the early childhood program um, there, which was inspired by the Jamaican experiment. So the only time that I got the attention of the Ministry of Finance when we were talking about randomized control trial that we did, was when we talked about, okay, 3.2 is the, for every dollar you invest, you get $3.2 um, in return. Because when we're talking about, uh, oh yes, the ASQ3 scale or the Bailey um, scale, and they get, you get a quarter of a standard deviation improvement for um, getting a child in this program, they are totally <laughs> falling asleep on me. Uh, but then, then I think that's, that's the sort of discussion that in the end, who are the clients of our discussions information going to be? Do, are we going to try to influence the decisions, the budgetary decisions in the country that are made in the end? So otherwise we can have you know, very uh, rigorously strong assumptions and discussions, but not get any results or any policy impacts, any policy change, um, if we don't mind who is that we're going to try to influence. To uh, uh, add to Calypso's point, I mean, to me, the whole definition of a shadow price is the monetary value of a good that does not have a market. <laughs> so that is implicitly, it is value laden, uh, right from. You know, there's nothing wrong with using dollars as a unit. <laughs> there's nothing wrong with that, but it's a value. It has nothing to do. You know, there we have to think beyond the market, right? And that's that's the problem that there's, there's a richer definition of value. So there's not, it's, I don't have a problem with using dollars as a unit. I have a problem with talking about monetary value because I think that's too, that doesn't add any nuance to the term value. Okay, so uh, actually that's a good point to end because the afternoon is very much devoted to this topic. I'm glad to see we haven't resolved everything. So it's worth coming back for the afternoon and we'll now, um, so thank you to the panelists and all the other participants.